Well, hi there, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. And don't forget, you can visit us at www.bibletalk.com or write to us at office at bibletalk.com. All right, uh, and as always, on behalf of Mark and Alice and myself, we want to greet you in the wonderful, the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Greetings, greetings. Who is the Word, the Word who is made flesh and dwelt among us. Uh, we're continuing on in our study of the prophet Amos, and uh, we're going to pick up again. This is our 10th part of this study, and we're going to start in this study at chapter 4, verse 1. So you can be turning to that as Brother Mark prays and asks God's blessing on our time together now. Oh Lord, we're about to get into a Bible study, and we just thank you for your word and the ability for us to get together to, to study it, Lord, and just open up your word so we can see it and incorporate it into our lives and hearts. Amen. 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 All right. Amos chapter four, verse one. Now we, we touched on this. This is kind of where we left off, but at the very last part of our, our last study. Mm -hmm. And I said, I would get back into this uh, today. So, we're reading 4.1. Hear this word, you cows of Bashan, who are on the mountain of Samaria, who oppress the poor, who crush the needy, who say to your husbands, bring now that we may drink. You know, when we started this study uh, 10 weeks ago, I had mentioned that this is something that's going to lead into what looks like, what looks like to a lot of people, a social gospel. All right. And certainly what you read here and what we'll read further on as we get into Amos points to the fact that there was great prosperity in Israel at this time, the time of Amos, right? Mm -hmm. And it was enjoyed by some, but surely not by all, right. okay? More accurately, the prosperity of some was at the expense of others. Right. And most accurately, it points to the love of money. Okay. And nothing has changed. Well, no. And, you know, this is uh, 750 years before Christ. Mm -hmm. And then sometime after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, you had the letter of James. And think about what he says, all right? I'm going to read James chapter 5, verses 1 through 6. Come now, you rich, weep and howl for your miseries which are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted and your garments have become moth-eaten. Your gold and your silver have rusted and their rust will be a witness against you and will consume your flesh like fire. It is in the last days that you have stored up your treasure. Behold, the pay of the laborers who mowed your fields and which has been withheld by you cries out against you. And the outcry of those who did the harvesting has reached the ears of the Lord of the Sabbath. You have lived luxuriously on the earth and led a life of wanton pleasure. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. You have condemned and put to death the righteous man. He does not resist you. At the expense of others. Mm -hmm. Remember, okay, where we're going to go on this, and I want you to think about, all right, is the teaching of Jesus Christ as opposed to the practice of the people of God all too often, right? Jesus said, But woe to you who are rich, for you are receiving your comfort in full. Woe to you who are well fed now, for you shall be hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. That's the Gospel of Luke. This is the words of Jesus in Luke 6, 24 and 25. Is that out of the Sermon of the Mount? And, well, yes, and in, uh, in the Gospel of Luke, yes, right. It's it's just the opposite of blessed is woe. Yeah, and we'll see that because remember Jesus said, "Blessed are yeah. the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven." Right, Matthew five three. So is this is this a social gospel? Is the Lord opposed to the rich? Let's start with what I just said. You know, Jesus said, "Blessed are the, the poor," right? Mm -hmm. But Jesus also said this in the Gospel of Luke, Luke 14, 33. He said, so then none of you can be my disciple 
who does not give up all his own possessions. I mean, listen, right. if you're a Bible-believing Christian, believe the Bible. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is what Jesus said. You can't be his disciple unless you give up all your possessions. Okay? Now, a true disciple of the Lord knows, and this is how we ended last week, I think, that he or she cannot own anything. You can't own anything. Now, I'm going to tell you, some of this may sound very radical to you, but this is the Word of God. The, the Word of God says this, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, all it contains, the world and those who dwell in it, Psalm 24, 1. If it, if, if, if the, it belongs to the Lord, then it doesn't belong to you. He didn't give ownership to anybody. No, he, ownership, stewardship, we, possession. We, we, we're stewardship over it. That's where I'm going. That's yeah. exactly right. where it's going. See, in the beginning, this is how the whole thing starts. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Genesis 1-1. Mm -hmm. If he created it, he owns it. That's right. It's his by right of creation, all right? You make something, it belongs to you. He made it all, and it all belongs to him. He never sold it. He never gave it away. And he owns it all. Mm -hmm. That it includes you. That's right. That it includes me. I mean, this is what the Word of God says. This is Paul writing to the Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. He says, Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own, for you have been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. Amen. But the Lord did give mankind stewardship and possession of his property. Yes. It says in Genesis 2.15, And the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to cultivate and keep it. Right? So he's putting him in there. He's giving him... He, he's in the, the, the land, in the garden. He's possessing it. And he has stewardship over it because he has been tasked. He has been given the ministry of cultivating it. <clears throat> now, when Adam and the woman were not faithful in their stewardship, mm -hmm. they lost possession. Yes. All right. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out from the Garden of Eden to cultivate the ground from which he was taken. Genesis 3.23. So he lost possession. He was still responsible for stewardship. Okay? Think about this now. Did he did he lose possession or did he give it? Well, I, he, he lost yeah. it by his choice of sin. Okay. Okay? So by his choice. By his choice, okay. yes. He chose to disobey God. The blessings of God, the love of God is it's not conditional. No. God loves. For God so loved the world. Right? Mm -hmm. But the promises of God are conditional. Yes. I mean, absolutely. Yeah. want to see, I don't think, I don't know if there's a word that appears more in the whole Bible than the word if. Yes. All right? <clears throat> so, I, I just said, I want to just give you a little example of this, and I, I, I pray that we can get through all of this. Years ago, Alice and I, now, you, you know, we've been doing missionary work for a long, long wow. time, but we had an apartment. We were blessed by a brother up in upstate New York who had just purchased three condominiums down here in Orlando, Florida, mm -hmm. which had been our base. <clears throat> and um, the Lord had spoken to me about moving, getting a new apartment. When I went up to New York for uh, entirely other reasons, and at a prayer meeting early one morning, this brother and I were together with one other brother, and we were praying. And I said, here's one thing you can pray for me. I said, God told me to move. We had given up the lease on another apartment. And I said, he, he told us to move, but he didn't tell me where. He, didn't tell me, he told me what not to do, but he didn't tell me what to do. Mm -hmm. And here's this brother sitting across the table. And he says, oh, he said, I just bought three condominiums down in Orlando as rental properties. So he said, why don't you take one of them? He gave me a very discounted rate for it if I would then take care of, manage the other two for him, right? Mm -hmm. So here's a perfect example of ownership Stewardship and possession. Mm -hmm. Okay, Alice and I moved in there. He's still um, our brother up in New York. He still owned it. It's his. It's his condominiums, right? But I had stewardship over all three of those, right? 
I was responsible for taking care of all three, but I only had possession of one. So there is a clear distinction between ownership, stewardship, and possession. Okay? It's like you go out and rent a car. You know, you can you get rent a car, they give you possession of it when you, you pay your little thing, you zip your credit card through, go to the Avis or Hertz or wherever, and they hand you the keys to the car. They're giving you possession of the car, and you certainly have stewardship over it. You are responsible for taking care of that car while you have it. But at no point do you own it. Right? Right. Now if you're if you're driving that car and somebody steals it from you, well, Avis or whoever still owns it, you're still responsible for it at that point. But somebody else entirely has possession of it. Okay? I mean you, you gotta think about this. Better yet, you better you know pray about this and get to understand that the these are three distinct phases of dealing with things, stuff. Okay. Now, and it, it relieves us of the burden. It, it does. I mean, because there are burdens to ownership. Absolutely. Okay, there, there really are. But God is a giver of good gifts. It says that every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above, mm -hmm. coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. James 1.17. So all good gifts come from the Lord. And he gives abundantly. Right? He, he, when, when Satan came to kill, steal, destroy, Jesus said, I came that you might have life and have it abundantly. Mm -hmm. And he gives it to us for the common good. Right? It says in 2 Corinthians 8, 14, Now, take notes. Pay attention. If you have questions or comments, uh, write to me at office at BibleTalk.com. Paul said, the Apostle Paul wrote, at this present time, your abundance being a supply for their need, so that their abundance also may become a supply for your need, that there may be equality. It's talking about within the body of Christ, right? Let me let me explain my theology to you. Don't you? Okay, I will. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for asking. God has promised to supply all of my needs through his riches and glory in Christ Jesus, right? That's a promise. That's his word. Mm -hmm. He watches over his word to perform it. So if I have a need in my life, his promise is that he's going to supply that. The interesting thing is that if I have a need, God is going to supply that need, but he's more likely to give it to Mark or somebody else than he is to give it to me. What, is he confused? <laughs> no, he is not confused, but he has a plan. You see, here's the plan. God knows that whoever he gives it to, he is entrusting them. If they have something that I needed, they don't. They now have, by definition, An abundance. abundance. Mm -hmm. uh, having abundance is having more than you need. So they've been given something that they didn't have a need for. But thank God, because they love me, and you look at what you love, if they see my need, then this is what John says in his first letter, then they're gonna they're gonna be generous and supply, give me that thing that they have in abundance to meet my need. And the really cool part about this is they'll get more blessed than me. Absolutely. Because Jesus said it is more blessed to give than to receive. So what happens is the blessing gets shared around the body. That's how it's intended to work. It's got nothing to do with love. It has everything to do with obedience. You said, oh, no, no. if they love you. Well, no, no, true. No. You oh, ought to love the brethren. No. But you, you can't. You can't. No, John says in his first letter that that is an expression of love. Yes. If you love your brother and you see him in need, you will deal with that. But it's even a, it, corporately, if you're a member of a, a church, one member might have an abundance of the word. Another one has the ability I, to I'm, earn wait, money. Wait, wait, wait. And, I, 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 I didn't put a I didn't put a limitation on right. what the abundance is. Right. Okay. Because God gives abundance. He meets all of the needs. I'm. I, we all have a need to be in the Word and to know the Word. So yes, He gives somebody an abundance of that. You know, I, I, I'm getting a little off track now, but I will tell you that when Alice and I first got saved forty a little over forty years ago, we had both been raised. I had been. We both were raised Roman Catholic. Right. Now forty years ago before the Second Vatican Council, and I don't know how much you know, 
uh, if you walked into a Catholic church as a kid, all right, and you made a sound, a peep in that church, other than doing the ritual, you know, responding mm -hmm. to the priest or singing a song in Latin, which you didn't yes. understand, the nun was behind you, whop you in the head, bless you, bop you in the head with a ruler, okay? You weren't allowed to make any noise in that church. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was typical that when we got saved as Catholics, what, what our heritage had been was to be quiet, right. very staid, right? Well, now, that wasn't necessarily true in my case because when I got saved, I got excited. But that's, <clears throat> I, I got real excited, you know, what most people thought. But God showed me I wasn't excited enough. So I had the opportunity very quickly to go out and share at a number of black Pentecostal churches in New York. Now, this is back in the 70s, right, the mid-70s. And there, you know, at that point in time, there were not a lot of Pentecostal or charismatic or even other kinds of churches around. Mm -hmm. They were all principally the mainline denominations. Yes. But I went into those black, black Pentecostal churches, and you know what I realized? I said, oh, my goodness, I'm a black Pentecostal. <laughs> because I'll tell you what, I could get up, and I could dance, and I could sing, and I could shout with the best of them. All right? They gave me something that they had an abundance and I didn't have. That's right. And what that was was an exuberance, a, a, a willingness to praise with all of their might. Right. Oh, and that served me well over all Absolutely. the years. That was their abundance. It met a need that I had in my life. Now, I'm telling you for the last 40 years, when I got called, I got called as a teacher. So perhaps I was able, and this is why they were inviting me into their churches, was to do teaching in those churches. Um, this is a ministry that I've had for four years, traveling, you know, we've been in five continents in 55 different countries. So God gave me an ab abundance of that. Well, it, it worked in perfect harmony. And that's the whole point. It should work in perfect because, harmony. Because, of the, because there were times that the black Pentecostals, there had to be a quiet time. Absolutely. So that was when we came in, when we brought in members of, the church that you had started, and we were kind of quiet, and they were so exuberant, but then we it was like balanced out because there was a time for the quiet, and there was a time for the... There is a balance. So we shared, right. you know. The, the, oh, everything should be done. I mean, there's a the balance. balance, yeah. Because it says in Proverbs twice, an unjust balance is an abomination to the Lord. But to, to, to talk about what you're saying, it was in First John that, that he wrote, whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? Right, right. So this is an expression. Okay. If you see my need or I see yours and give to you out of my abundance, we both get blessed. That's the yeah, point. That's it. And the best part is it's more blessed to give than to receive. This is how a body functions. You know, you used the term a minute ago, and it's funny because Alice and I were having a conversation about this just this morning, about being a member of a church. Mm, right. Well, first of all, we're not members of a church. We are the church. And we're not supposed to be members of a church. We're members of a family. That's right. And there's a big difference. See, too often, the people of God, into their religion, got in the, fact, got in the habit of thinking they're part of a religion. No, we're part of a family. Mm -hmm. And remember that it all started as a family. It all started with Abram and Sarah, That's with right. Abraham and Sarai, Sarah, having the fulfillment of the promise that a child would be born to them miraculously. That would be the beginning of that family of God, all right? So don't be a member of a church. Be a member of the family. And if you, concept if you don't understand the distinction yeah. between those two, please do yourself a favor. Get someplace quiet. Go and have a conversation with the Lord. That's called prayer. Have a conversation with the Lord and say, you know, give me understanding. Give me a clear understanding of what that means. Because if you don't understand it now, it'll change your life. Amen. Amen. It, is, it says in Romans 8, the Apostle Paul wrote very clearly, those who are being led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. Amen. And that does mean sons and daughters. Amen. We are the family of God, okay? So the believers in the early church held all things in common. Mm -hmm. They shared with any, anyone among them who might have need. And it says that there was not a needy person among them. That's right. Acts 2, go read it. Acts 2, Acts 4, all right? So they held all, all things in common. They didn't think anything was their own. 
because they understood the word of God. So were they communists? No, they were Christians. That's right. We need to be aware and concerned for the needs of others, especially our brothers and sisters. It says, going on in 1 John, 1 John chapter 3, he says, we know love. By the way, this is 1 John 3, 16. Coincidentally, rack this up with John 3:16. Yes. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, and that we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? So does that make us socialists? No, it makes us followers of Jesus Christ. It makes us Christian. Now, I, I, I'm going to make a confession here, right? I joyfully follow and serve the will of a king, the king, mm. rather than the will of the majority. Mm. Does that choice, rather than democracy, make me anti-American? No, it makes me a Christian. <laughs> I'm not driven by the American dream to be ambitious, wanting to own a big home, mm. a new car, fancy this and fancy that, and whatever material goods I can obtain. But I am ambitious. I promise you that. As a matter of fact, I am very, very ambitious. Because the Word of God says, therefore, we also have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to him. That should that's be the, our that's our goal. Second Corinthians goal. 5, 9. You see, and I want to tell you something. Because a lot of people, you know, oh, are you speaking against riches? No, I'm not. Because riches are not the problem. Yeah. Money is not the problem. The love, love of money is the problem. Right. Trusting in money rather than trusting in God, that's the problem. Mm -hmm. It is indeed serving mammon, worldly wealth. And it is indeed idolatry, okay? <laughs> Remember what Jesus said. No man can serve two masters. You'll love the one and you will despise the other, right? Led by the Holy Spirit, listen to what the Apostle Paul wrote. Now, he is a man who learned a mystery. And he said, I know how to get along with humble means. I also know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. Philippians 4.12. And he told others, he told us, mm -hmm. set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ and God. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. Colossians 3, 2, and 5. And be aware that the love of money and riches can be very sneaky and subtle. It really can. You know, Alice and I had friends uh, um, years ago, we spent a lot of time with, who were Christian financial counselors. They were very successful guys. They were very, very, very loving of the Lord, very into the word. But that's what they did. They dealt with, they dealt with wealthy Christians, helping them to invest wisely and godly. All right. So we got together, I guess maybe there were like six of us at a luncheon in Sarasota, Florida. I, I don't remember. This must have been in the mid or late 90s. And we're sitting around at the country club, don't you know? And we're having this conversation. There's one fellow there. You may have heard of him. His name is Gary Moore. He has written any number of books on Christians and, and money, right? And in the course of the conversation, he and I are sitting like where Mark is to, to me. And Gary says, well, you know, the world, the, the world says money talks. I'm sure you've heard that. Mm -hmm. And I said to him, yeah, so does Jesus. And he said, what? I said, Jesus said money talks. He just says it lies. <laughs> he said, beware the deceitfulness of riches. Money is always lying to you. Yeah. 
That's money is saying to you, pick up a dollar bill. It says in God we trust. Uh, uh, uh. It says in money we trust. That's what it should say. That's because right. it's saying to you, it's speaking to you. And it's saying, I can cure, I can take care of your problem. I can, I can fix it. I can deal with it. I can, <clears throat> it's lying. The deceitfulness of riches. And it's always, always there. It's the propaganda. Right? It is. And that's why we have the, the warning against the deceitfulness of riches. Mm -hmm. Now, before I get into the reason that here the Lord speaking through Amos is singling out the wives, yes. <laughs> I need to deal with the greatest heresy or one of the great heresies of our time. Although it's not a new heresy by any means. It's called sowing a seed. It is most often trying to sowing a seed is trying to buy the blessings of God. And worse yet, for those who are in fact trying to sell the blessings of God. Mm -hmm. It is an issue as crafty and as subtle as the one who created the lie, that serpent of old. All right. Just think of these three things. There was Gehazi. Mm -hmm. Gehazi was the servant of Elisha, mm -hmm. the, the man of God, the prophet. And it says in 2 Kings 5.20, but Gehazi, remember, that's just when uh, Naaman came. came. Because it was leprosy. And Elisha didn't even meet with him. He just sent word out to him, go dip into Jordan seven times. So when he did, and he was cured of his leprosy, Elisha wouldn't take anything from him. But Gehazi goes chasing after him. And it says, but Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, the man of God, thought, behold, my master has spared this name in the Aramean by not receiving from his hands what he brought. As the Lord lives, I will run after him and take something from him. Second, you know what he got? He got the leprosy that had been on Naaman. Or Simon the magician in Acts, in the book of Acts, it says, now when Simon saw that the spirit was bestowed through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money saying, give this authority to me as well so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, may your silver perish with you because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. Mm -hmm. Acts 8, 18 to 20. Think about Martin Luther in the Roman Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Protestant Reformation came Jesus. out of this one thing. And that's what the 95 Theses were all about. It was about the selling of indulgences. Mm -hmm. It was the Catholic Church selling the blessings that they, they said were theirs to, to give yeah. mm -hmm. so that they could build the Vatican. Think about what Jesus Christ said. To contrast, when he sent his disciples out, he said, go. He sent them out and said, heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Well, we're going to pick this up, and I don't know whether you're going to like it, but I'll promise you it'll be the word of God and it'll bless you Praise in our next session. Father, we just thank you, Lord God, you, that you did give us in abundance all of the things that we need. You gave us more than we need so that we can turn around and bless others with those gifts that come from you. Lord, help us to have that spirit, that heart that was in, that you had, because you loved the world so much, you gave that thing most precious to you, your only begotten son, Jesus Christ. Help that to be our desire and our attitude. Father, in Jesus' name. Well, it's going to get exciting here. You may not like it, but I promise you it'll be getting exciting and it'll be the word of God. So till next time, God bless you. God bless you. So I cherish that old rugged cross till my truth.